Yes. At this time, I'd ask anybody wishing to make the public comment uh, to address the council at this time. We'll move forward then. Uh, discussion of pending renewal of the hotel motel tax agreement between the city and the chamber. And uh, Brooke, I think I've just seen you walk in. Do you have anything you want to present on that matter? Um. They all have copies of what you emailed. Excellent. Of, uh, what your version is that your I think your board approved right. or something. Uh, okay. Both of, and I, uh, Brody Bertram, who's the uh, uh, president of the tourism, um, came along too. Um, he wasn't able to attend some of the past meetings. We just took uh, what the county has um, and just put the city's name on it. You see the bylaws from our previous. Uh, the biggest thing that I wanted to clear up, uh, talking to the mayor. Um, was we want the city's involvement every year um, on budget, what we're doing, how we're doing, and not just waiting for a deadline of an agreement. But if we're not doing what the city's wanting, we would hope that we could present this on a continual basis every year, kind of what are our plans, and start promoting and working together for long-term kind of, the, we, we run this stuff past Karen at uh, FCDA. We want a, a, an image for our whole community and not just something that happens every six months we make up something or anything else, but a long-term branding and that kind of stuff. So we definitely want a partnership with the city and how we're doing and that kind of stuff. So even though um, it's perpetual or and those things, but we want an annual review. You're, you're seeing our board members, you're seeing our, um, you're seeing our budget, those type of things. So we definitely want input on how we're doing and that kind of stuff. So. And if you have any questions or comments or yeah, um, yeah, Brooke, I've read over both agreements, and I, I understand completely where you're coming from. It seems like the county's is a little bit cleaner in some areas. The one area that I had some issues with, not an issue, but a concern about, I guess I should say, is having a perpetual agreement. Mm -hmm. I personally feel that I, I like the way this last one was structured between the city and the chamber. Uh, it, it keeps the council from ruling into perpetuity. It doesn't bind anybody any further than the dates given. I think we had 10 years the last time. Mm -hmm. And personally, I think that that's a, a good idea, six to 10 years. Uh, things can change, you know, and it gives a way for uh, either entity to maybe try to try and have a vote of the people to, to either extend it or modify the provisions however you see fit. And I think that uh, if we get caught up in a perpetual agreement, I think that maybe we might lose something in the, in the meantime. Mm -hmm. uh, based on that, I, I personally like the city's agreement, the portion, only because we're watching after the city's portion of the dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not so concerned about the county. You don't have a lot of outlay that's coming in from out of the county or out of the, the city limits of Hampton, as we discussed the last time. But uh, Personally, my opinion is I like the city's agreement, and I think that it's a little bit cleaner, and I would like to stick to a term limit. And the only questions I do want to make sure for, for our own information is if there was a problem, even at the 10-year or 6-year or 7-year, we would still have to take it to the people to vote on. Right. So, I, I mean, that's where the, you know, the, the, the county side is. And I would just soon have an annual review in some, you know, that we have this talking Right. And not waiting for a 10 year. I think a couple of years ago it came up that oh well we'll review that when it, when your when your contract expires. I want input, or I, I think the board, everyone wants input all the time on an ongoing basis. So that's the only thing that concerns me about doing a, a, a 10 year or a six years. We'll be doing this again as compared to doing it every year. So that's my only concern. There's nothing preventing us from meeting annually. I mean. A good time to meet would be also some of the terms of the agreements is that the, the chamber would provide the council with an audit, mm -hmm. or uh, which would be different than your budget and your expenditures. But the audit, at least everybody can see where we're at. And, and that's what we, you know, that's why we have an ex officio uh, for the city council. Ron's on. You get the financials on a monthly basis, and we can give you whatever you want with questions anytime you want it. But uh, on an annual basis, we're hoping that you do see what we're doing and and uh, seeing our financials. So. Well, and that's the other thing, too. You talk about the ex officio members, but also the city's portion spells out in Section C the Board of Directors and who it will be comprised of where the county doesn't address that. Right. So 
that's why I'm saying that in my personal opinion, I think that I'd like the city portion better because it does give the agreement more structure. Okay. So, uh, Brooke, how many times, um, how often are you auditing the books? Are you doing it at all? or? Well, from a, a auditing, a, a depending on the term, mm -hmm. audit the books. Well, it audit means audit. Yes, from a CPA audit, we have not ever had our books audited. We okay. had a, 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 not a compilation, but a, a review uh, mm -hmm. two years ago. Um, and that was one of the things we were concerned about, is depending on from the legal term when this was posed in 2002, a lot of churches do audits and those type of things, audit committees, those things. When you're a CPA and you say, I did an audit, that means something completely different right. Than what a nonprofit may say, an audit means. Uh, Cindy Mullenbeck is the sole writer of the checks. She does reviews on it, and uh, Patty Helsko reviews all of her financials, along with uh, uh, Jeff Jakes does all of her payroll, and then we use um, Steve Pearson to do all of her tax returns. Um, we have not gone through an audit procedure like the city of Hampton does a true audit, and that's where I went over and talked to Megan today about. These agreements even with the county says an audit. What would an audit be if you asked for an audit? A true audit from a CPA? That, that, that would be quite expensive. Um, it is quite expensive, but it also is a very good safeguard. Correct. Mm -hmm. So I would think maybe maybe not annually, mm -hmm. but once every five years. You know, you have to look at it like that. We get $20,000, $22,000 budget. Uh, uh, that review cost us close to three thousand dollars. A true audit may cost five if you want to give every five years. If it, does the tourism, should we take that out of the tourism money, or should we take that out of the? Because it's a completely different account with a different signer, everything else. So are we auditing just the tourism money? You maintain the balance changes? at the end of the year anyway. Why couldn't you use that part of that balance for for the audit? It's purely, I mean, if that's what y'all would like to do, I, I can bring it I think it would more. be advantageous for both of us. Okay. Okay. Well, I can understand where you're coming from, but I think for the amount of money that actually is running through that, to spend that much money is not a good use of money. I think when you have people reviewing it and watching that, I think that's good enough. I don't think you should have to pay $3,000, $4,000 when your budget is as small as it is. Now, for the city of Hampton, for the amount of money we have, sure. But again, it comes down to that technicality and definitions of the accountant. And yeah, I, I, I for one, chips. don't think that they should have to audit the books. Now, they have people overseeing them and watching them, reviewing it, sure. And I don't know what all the terms are. But to spend that much money, I think, is a waste of money. Well, there are multiple people that are involved in the process. Unless there's a conspiracy of some sort going on, uh, it's going to be held in check. But the other part of that, too, Dick, and I agree with you, the part of the Chamber's proposal to the county is that it does say that you will pay for that. So, I mean, the best thing is you've got to be careful. Yeah, if, you ask, if, if you ask this for an audit, ask for it, so. we, we would do that. And I guess that would be the question we would look at is, is the audit and would we go through that? And that's a, according to this agreement, we would have to do that. Um, and so from that, I'm open to it. On an annual basis, that's where I've been kind of playing around. Wow, I want to make sure that I come here, you feel very comfortable with my financials. It's not, it's not that I... No, no, I, I understand that, Steve. I mean, I mean, it's just the cost. That there's a cost with that kind of... Well, it's always a cost. And it continues to get more expensive as with uh, uh, the audit term becomes more and more expensive mm -hmm. because you have to have... It'll be out of Mason City. No one here in town can do an audit. No one in town could even do a review or compilation because you have to be familiar with that industry. Mm -hmm. So that means I have to go up to use a, a firm out of Mason City to do that. Um, which again, we're I don't know. If you're not a chamber member. All those wonderful things that you kind of go through. But you want your you want to believe in the numbers we're giving. Um, and have some verification. So if I understand correctly, we're not requiring an audit, but the option's there if we ask The option's the there if you want to. I'm fine with leaving yeah. that in there, but mm -hmm. you may come down to a point where we might need to request that, then you can't. So well, I was never against not leaving it right. in there. But what yeah. I was thinking, if, we, if they did it a periodic, it doesn't have to be five years. If you did it, say you have a 10-year agreement. At the end of that 10-year agreement, you do one. Well, and that that be the question of what are we negotiating for? Because the the one before, it, it's which one are we editing? 
doesn't take the audit. I came to you before and said we want to do the exact same thing as the county, and there's not a, the only difference between those agreements are county versus city. And, 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 and that was in there, and I was like, oh, oh, you know, okay. But I, I feel confident in what we're doing that if you ask for an audit, we give you one um, and, and figure out how to, to come up with it. Um, but again, if we're not taking this type of agreement but we're going on the other side, then everything else goes back to square one. So we were just trying to say from, from tourism and from the chamber, both uh, the chamber board and tourism board authorized us to negotiate this agreement. So if, if we wanted to start drafting something different, then I'll have to take it back to our side of who's drafting, who's editing, and those types of things. Nothing could be changed actually, or percentage wise, or not percent, yeah, percentage wise, and the amount we collect without a vote from the citizens, correct? Right. Correct. I guess I'm perfectly comfortable with that and not having a term limit on that. As long as once a year you know you're coming in and you are, in January, you're giving us an accounting. I don't think we need an audit every year. But I'm more comfortable without a set term of two years or whatever. I know for me, I'm, I'm okay with the perpetual aspect as long as we're getting that annual review and you have a termination clause in here. So, I mean, why would, you know, if you set it for 10 years, what are you going to do different at the end of the 10 years? Are we going to end up just discussing this whole thing again? That, that was kind of the, the the word perpetual. I'm not a big fan of that term either because it's just not quite what we're getting into. But it is purely it should be an annual. I mean, we should talk about this annually. You're approving my board. We sh we should have both sides uh, input into how we're doing. And, and if you're not liking it, then then knowing it right up front would be a lot easier than waiting until another agreement were to come up. Well, like I said earlier, Brooke, I just I felt more comfortable with the term limit. Uh, it, it's our right to ask what's being done with the money, and I think everybody understands that. We, oh, have, yeah. that, uh, we have that responsibility. I agree. Um, the other thing I would like to see is that, uh, you know, I'm okay with, without an audit per se. Uh, I want to know how much money was collected, how much money was distributed to the Greater Franklin County Chamber of Commerce from Hampton funds. Mm -hmm. How much of that money and how it was dispersed within the city of Hampton. That's all I asked. That's all I asked last time. Mm -hmm. I think maybe some of that might have got a little bit misconstrued that I was anti chamber. Oh. And that's not the truth. What my point is is that I have the responsibility to answer to everybody here where those monies and how they're distributed. And that's what I want to do, and that's what I'm going to do. And we want to continue with that. Anytime you have a question, we want to answer it for you to the best of our ability as quickly as possible. Sure. So I don't have a problem whatsoever on that. Thank you. Appreciate it. And I guess I'd like to say that we, we want to tell you what we're doing. We, we, we're proud of what the work we're doing, and hopefully our money is going to bring people to Franklin County and to better the people in the county. <coughs> so, so I, don't know okay. I assume you being new. I just I assume there's something because I listen to everybody, but there's some type of a system in place that if there was like some type of red flag. There's a type of check and balance system going on that if we did question something, that you would bring that to our attention, right? Right. I mean, I see where you're going, you know, and it's unfortunate, and I hope I don't say this wrong, but it's unfortunate that we do have to keep such a close eye on monies anymore because it does happen. Mm -hmm. Do I think it'll happen here? I want to say no. But, you know, unfortunately, you do have to. Well, there have been several instances of late, especially in the state of Iowa, where money's been wrongfully taken. Yeah. And it's. Terrible, you have to think that way, but but you do. Yeah, I'm, I'm not accusing anybody of anything. Nothing else. An audit will protect you more than it will hurt you. But we have that option. Is the right. way I understand it. Okay. Yeah, so if you leave the wording this the same, it's it sounds like everybody's in agreement. The city may periodically request an audit, which they haven't yet, ten years, and shall receive a copy thereof, all of the cost of the chamber. If something happens, a red flag. City can request an audit, or they don't have to. Right. Do you guys want to re request any changes? I know Craig brought 
couple, just a couple of typos, and those are minor. But um, you know, with leaving it with the county's version. Bear in mind that Section Seven says that the purpose of this agreement is to provide tourism to the city of Hampton and to provide funds for the tourism industry. So. I interpret that to mean that the 60% money at 5% that you collect from the city of Hampton through hotel motel tax will be spent only in Hampton. Is that correct? We have not used that uh, type of formula for any of the grant uh, type. Uh, it came up in our last meeting. That's not the formula. Is, that's part of the agreement. This agreement is to provide tourism to the city of Hampton and to provide funds for the tourism industry. Right. You collect a 5% sales tax. Right. On a tax on each hotel motel room that's rented right. in Hampton. Of that 100% that is collected, of that 5%, 60% is distributed to you folks. That's where I'm getting this. Correct. Correct. Okay. So we collect the 60%. Mm -hmm. So what was your question again? I'm sorry. No, so I'm pointing out a section in your own contract that, that the agreement is to provide the tourism to the city of Hampton okay. and to provide funds for the tourism industry. Does that mean all that sole sixty percent that you collect from Hampton money will be spent in Hampton? I I feel that regardless if the if the event is in the county, um, you know, the, like you said, all the hotel rooms are in Hampton, so they'll be coming back into Hampton using Hampton um, businesses and things like that. But the majority of the things we get asked to give money to are in the Hampton area. But is that, that's is not that what your agreement says, Brody. Yeah. So maybe it's just a matter of wording, wording. but... Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we took the county, and there discuss. says the, the county and to provide funds for the tourism industry, and I guess the parts it would be is any kind of maps, any kind of brochures, what percentage would you say is good for city versus county? I mean, that, that that's the part that it would be, how do you prorate that? I don't know how you do that. It's not my agreement. Gotcha. I, I drafted this. I, I typed it out and everything. And I, when I got to that, I had that same question. I was going to leave in county, but then I thought that the question would come up, why does it say county and not Hampton when it says Hampton the rest of the time? So I, I, I do see where you're coming from. If you break it down that way with the amount of tax that we're taking in, Hampton far and away is, takes in more money than the rest of the county. I'm not saying that that I think the county needs to enjoy the same thing. And I would agree with that. I'm just pointing out what I've read. Now, if I would change it to county, would it would the same question come up? That's, like I said, I, I went back and forth on it two or three times when I drafted it. Well, in my opinion, no, it wouldn't, Brody, because that's still a county agreement. I still pay for the city. Oh, okay. yeah. But I understand exactly yeah, what you're saying. Yeah. So correct me if I'm wrong, but the question is is that the 60% gets is collected um, from Hampton, gets transferred to the Chamber for Tourism, and the agreement said, the current agreement says to promote and develop tourism within the city of Hampton to the resulting economic benefit of its citizens. So if they're giving grants to something outside of the city of Hampton, um, and if you're if you're okay with that, then the wording needs to be tweaked uh, so that they can develop and promote tourism um, in the area or, in, or in, to promote Franklin County. It just needs, or if you're not okay with it, then. And if I could kind of put that, I mean, Jim's been on the board for a couple of years. Um, before that, I mean, I came into it, the boards, I mean, it, one of the things that came up was a beds on head strategy on promoting. Then we had to go to the mission statement, which is said for day or overnight. That became a mission statement. Now we're like going, okay, are we prorating? I mean, if someone in Sheffield wants, uh, you know, to do an event, should they get priority over one in, in Hampton? Um, Donis, who's the uh, vice president, also runs the Heritage Bed and Breakfast. That came up, and, and that was. One of our agenda items is how should we be promoting the county? And, and, and even she was saying, you know what, we bring business to Hampton just by being in here. So promoting, like the Geneva Betterment got a grant voted in that they're having a flea market in downtown Geneva. Wait, there's no hotels in Geneva. Should we disallow that because it's not promoting Hampton? And that's the part that I say, should we leave it to the board for their recommendation or are we trying to, you know, 
trying to go a little bit too much on saying, okay, we got to give 60% of the dollars received or leave it to the board for them to decide on the grants because they have sole voting and they're completely autonomous of the chamber board. And that's the other part of it. This is a complete independent board. The funds are completely kept separate and there's no... You know, that's why they vote how much they're going to give to the chamber to manage as compared to saying, oh, we'll just put all the funds together and try to parrot it out. I mean, they vote on how they want their budget and how they're spending for, for um, uh, grants and, and what they're using for that. So, I don't know. Well, if you look at definition of tourism, what you're, we're trying to do is to bring people from outside the county into here. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that money is spent on advertising outside of Franklin County, yeah. period, for the, for the result of to bring the people in here which they do end up staying in the hotels, it's usually in Hampton. And shopping, most of the, is going to be shopping in Hampton. <coughs> so I guess I look at it that way, and I know it, the way it's worded, but I just look at it to more you, you are bringing people from outside. So it's not only, it's not just, you're not promoting tourism to Hampton people, you're promoting outside of Hampton, outside Franklin County. We're always trying to couple some things from outside the county with something that's already going on inside the town just to to keep them here for, for that was with the beds on heads strategy somewhat but i mean the longer you can keep them here the more they enjoy everything it's heads on beds not beds on heads. <laughs> oh yeah my bad nobody <laughs> we're suffocating <laughs> I think we need to be cognizant of the fact that um, we're going to grow as a community, as a county community, <coughs> not as an individual community of Hampton. Um, everything is getting bigger in our world today, and in order for us to survive as a community, we have to survive as a county. And I, I have no problem seeing that 60% being spent in Geneva to promote the events you're talking about or somewhere else. Because that's going to be how we're going to survive in the future. Mr. Sukup called me this last week and was very concerned that the tourism might be promoting increasing the hotel motel tax. And he wanted me to pass along that uh, he had just booked 10 rooms because they were having their dealership meeting here in Hampton instead of up in, because he's wanting to promote our tourism and that stuff. And he was like, you know, and that's the concerns I have is here we have Sheffield. And we have funded some things in Sheffield, but trying to make sure that people look at this as a county because they don't have a hotel. And right there, they get to make a decision between, you know, going up to Mason City for a hotel or coming to Hampton. And the part that, you know, we're trying to continue, I think that that is the big thing, is the, the better, you know, Sheffield goes, we are getting an economic bump from it. And, and trying to promote what we have in Hampton is a good thing. I think the solution, in my personal opinion, there would be to just clean up the language. Yeah. Uh, this isn't a, uh, a deal stopper for anybody. It's just a matter of in which agreement. Well, the one proposed or our old one. I like our old agreement. Again, I'm going to continue to go back to that, but clean up the language because some things have changed. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, we were dealing with the chamber versus the Greater Franklin County Chamber. So I mean, that would have to be changed as well. But. Uh, wouldn't necessarily, we're a DBA, our corporate name is the Hampton Area Chamber of Commerce, okay. um, so you can still run however you want to do it. Okay. So. I, I guess for my benefit tonight, I want to, I want some direction from the council on which, which of these agreements do you want uh, me to tweak uh, to bring back to you? Uh, do you want to me to work on what Brooke has prepared or that reflects what the county agreement is, or do you want to go off of our existing one that's uh, up for renewal and updated? Do you want perpetual, or do you want uh, a term ending in a, in a certain number of years? So I know a couple of you have indicated uh, perpetual is okay, and a couple have indicated the term is okay, so I need a little more way in on that. Well, I mean, either way, they've got to vote on it. But, Craig, would the concerns that you're raising, would those be able to be integrated into what Brooke has proposed, or would you still default to the original agreement? With the I would still prefer, my own personal opinion, but here is to go back with the city agreement only because, like I said, uh, we're dealing with city funds. Okay. Uh, this is, has a little bit more structure. The oversight is the same. There's some wording that needs to be tweaked, but I would still use this as our default agreement. Is there any other uh, opinions, of any, any other way on that? 
agreement with Craig disagreement on that? I'm fine with the perpetual aspect. And um, I'm also very comfortable with the presentation of the information that the Chamber has been giving us on an ongoing basis. Um, they're well aware that uh, if there was a situation that required an audit, that we've got to pay for it. But uh, putting demands on them to do an audit, I don't see it. So to answer Ron's question, which direction would everybody like to see him go? Work on the county or work on the city? You know, there's a couple of the main differences that I see are uh, there's some things that aren't in the county version, which talks about the board of directors. You know, board of directors, how it's structured and set up is in ours. Um, e, debt, chamber shall not borrow money or issue bonds for tourism purposes without prior approval from the city. That's not in the one that Brooke is proposing. How important is that to you? Um, and then the other part, I guess I would say, is, is we provided to you our bylaws, which are which were part of the section before, which those bylaws were not in effect when you all did the other agreement, because until you did the agreement, they didn't structure bylaws for that board. So it's kind of like the county didn't put the bylaws in their agreement because we had the bylaws. So why re, you know, redo them? So it's just a question of putting bylaws in the agreement. Um, because how do we change the bylaws if need be when we have an agreement with you all if we want to change the number of voting members or anything else. I, I just, I, I would like you to take a look or take the time to look at the bylaws of this board, uh, but, you know, which you'll see a lot of that in your agreement. So now you've got an agreement <laughs> instead of having bylaws. Another item is number six, hold harmless. Although they have a hold harmless in, in this and so it's uh, somewhat abbreviated. Ours just goes further to explain that the chamber is responsible for maintaining all workers' comp coverage, liability coverage, and other needed insurance relative to the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Um, the city is a separate entity from the chamber. So, I mean, is that language important to you uh, to keep or? direction you want to, get, want to go. I mean, I, I, I think you could meld the two agreements together uh, pretty well. I mean, I think you could um, bring what Craig's looking for from the city agreement and put it into what, what Brooke has brought us. Um, I mean, if, if, you, if you could identify uh, the, the specific sections. Um, has everybody read this? I mean, it's where I understand, but... Right. Apples and oranges, for right. sense, but well, I guess well, you, what, I, what I mean is you, you've highlighted specific mm -hmm. portions, and and I think I think there are areas, like you said, where it's apples and oranges, but I think um, those are areas, like I said, where you've identified mm -hmm. the differences, and so then you replace where there's a difference with what you prefer to the city. I was just going to say I, I'd like to see them as consistent as possible. I couldn't quite figure out why you have two pretty different in some ways right. agreements but as consistent as possible and I and also I don't necessarily want to like dictate to the tourism board the exact number that they have to have I mean it's almost to me it's a little bit micro or micro versus macro management where we have you to tell the numbers them, of people. yeah like you have to have nine members oh, on okay. your tourism yeah. board I sure. mean if you find like as things change in the worst the Hampton Chamber became big greater Franklin County maybe there would be a need to you want to add a couple more people to that board I don't have a problem with that but if we say in the agreement you have to have nine does that mean you'd have to come back and we'd have to pass another resolution to allow that I mean, I don't know. So, we like guess you know, I like the oversight and so forth as consistent as possible, but to give you the amount of freedom to do your job, because I don't want to have to do your job for you. But at least with the city's proposal, Jim, what I'm getting is it provides structure. Right. How, how you work oh, that. Oh, I'm fine. I'm not fine with that. Yeah. Would everybody be in agreement if we have uh, Ron work on paring down the city's agreement and addressing those? Issues. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
melding the two crates? I mean, you're going to have to read it again and go over it before you vote on it. Well, I don't mind reading it. I, yeah, yeah. I enjoy I, reading this stuff. Yeah, so. yeah, I don't. Well, maybe uh, you could read it for us, Sean. <laughs> that's Ralph's job. Oh, okay. Um, including addressing item seven on the captain's the purpose, including addressing that. Um, changing the wording now. Pardon me? On which one? Is that on the seven? Well, in the counties, the one you were raising the question on as far as the city of Hampton, maybe as Brody was referring to, maybe it should include the county and the, county and, and, uh, the purpose. So. Yeah, does everybody or the majority agree that, that uh, grants that are given outside of the city of Hampton, city limits, still can benefit the city of Hampton? Well, yeah. uh, you know, we got to tweak the wording so that it, it just, it just kind of sounds like it's limiting funds should stay within the city of Hampton. So, tweet that. The only thing I realized is that on the final draft, my name is spelled right. Uh, that's where I just copy your Yeah, I just, yeah. I think it was. Well, come on. You're right under that bus. They did what they wanted to do. Thank you, Mayor. I have a handout for you. Thank you. Thank you. touch with some of the uh, a request for no parking zones uh, that we just did up uh, 10th and 11th Avenue Northeast and if you recall the signage up there um, it was a request to go to 730 to 4 p.m. school days only basically for no parking and had a gentleman uh, Mr. Haas 414 4th Avenue Southeast um, he had called the street department and uh, Randy Greek and I discussed that and I got in touch with Mr. Haas to find out what his concerns are. And basically he's just requesting the same thing. Currently what we have is from 7th Street Southeast to uh, Highway 65 or 4th Street Southeast. On the north side of 4th Avenue Southeast it's no parking anytime on that side of the street basically. Um, and what he's requesting is to change those signs uh, to implement the 7.30 to 4 p.m. Uh, school days uh, because he would like to you know have people be able to park in the street for different functions as well and and different things um, totally agrees that during school you know it is congested and the no parking is great but uh, would after hours uh, in the summertime um, you know and on weekends uh, have that access to the uh, public streets so um, I, I advise I bring that up to the workshop and if you're in agreement with that um, I can go ahead and get a uh, uh, get some proposals done and, and uh, bring that forward to a future council meeting for a vote if somebody wants to do that. This is the same restriction we just uh, put in place for 10th, uh, 10th Avenue and 11th Avenue. Yep, same, same, yep strain, same restrictions and, and I, I kind of like it because I like the consistency of it and, uh, and the ability then to have some signs on hand. Um, we just did this one a few years ago, um, but uh, it would be nice to, uh, you know, have some consistency around the schools, maybe. Um, but that's entirely up to you. Jeff, would you tell me again, please, on Fourth Avenue Southeast, mm -hmm. which streets you're talking about, from where to where again? Seventh was that one of them? Yeah, it's okay. on Fourth Avenue, the north right. side of Fourth Avenue, from Seventh Street Southeast to Fourth Street Southeast. Okay. Yeah, on the north side. 
currently no parking. All, you, all they'd be doing is be oh. adding to the sign from 7.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. School days. So yep. evenings you could park there. Yep, evenings you could park there and, and uh, on school days. And then if it's not a school day, you would, you would uh, still be able to park there. So I believe we had the word for school days. Only on school yeah. days. What about like other schools like Northside? Do we have any no parking? Similar should, are other are there other signs then that we should just take a look at all of them and I think change it, that accordingly? I think maybe in order to get a broader consistency, Jim, that'd be a good idea. Um, I have people park in my driveway over right across the street from Northside. But yeah, That's there there's some signs on uh, Second Street there, um, and I think if we uh, if we do something, I think we might as well check all the school areas to assure that we have uh, some consistency. And that, and that would save us dollars in the long run, too, for, uh, you know, when we purchase signs and whatnot. Um, you know, because there is a set-up fee if you do something a little bit out of the norm, which is kind of what we're doing by adding in some times. So. Yeah, I think at least check it, but, you know, maybe there might be a certain need by a school that you'd want to leave it, no parking, I think we, but I would at least take a look and just... Mm -hmm. Review all the options. Or review all the. I could definitely areas. bring that information all together to the next workshop for sure. Well, one thing about Second um, Second Street in your area is it's a substantially narrower street. Mm -hmm. It's only wide enough for three vehicles at any time, and we just put that so in we place just, just about three years that ago. alone then too. So it's, it's it is very constrictive. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, it is. I'm trying to drive the bus down through there to pick up kids. It's exciting. I just like to get out of my driveway some days. Any other questions on that? All right. Yeah, we can bring that forth to us at the next workshop then. Yeah. And yes, then uh, don't go too far. Nope. Uh, next is a request for no parking zone on the 600 block of 2nd Street Southeast near Hampton <coughs> Rehabilitation Center. Uh, this, was, uh, this has been brought forth as a concern for quite some time from the uh, a resident in that neighborhood uh, who, who deals with um, employees of the Rehabilitation Center of Hampton parking out in front of his house uh, as though it's parking lot and, and he, would, he would like to have that parking spot, I guess. And he, he has indicated to me that he's gone back and forth with Rehab Center in Hampton and uh, so I told him I'd, I'd bring up a uh, discussion uh, to the council to see if you guys were uh, open to doing anything for him. Uh, keeping in mind, uh, as I as I told him that uh, you know a no parking limitation uh, means him just as well as it does uh, the employees, and uh, the suggestion was that uh, maybe there could be limited amount of time so that um, it would allow him to park there uh, when he's home from work, essentially. Um, if you take a look at the uh, the uh, handout I just provided you, you can actually see where the vehicles are parked in front of this gentleman's house, and there's, you know, a lot of other parking opportunities in the area. Yeah. This, this photo actually shows it. Right. Do, you, do you all know which property we're talking about? Oh, yeah. Seven. Which house? Oh, okay. 733, 431041, 2nd Street Southeast. Yeah, in this picture, there's, there's three vehicles parked out in front of the property. I'm assuming, I'm assuming none of which are his. Every day, there's three vehicles parked there. Which one? Right. He says he's here. So, one, one, this one right here. This is, this is. Yeah. Right. One, zero, one, one. Yes. Well, is that a one? Yeah. 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 One, zero, one, one. Yes. Well, is that a one? Yeah. So does it appear the parking lot and the rehab center has openings there I mean oh, they yeah. have, I mean is that along the north side there there are those are all spaces yeah. there right and additionally okay. that dirt that dirt gravel parking lot there uh -huh. that belongs to them yeah. as well because this has been something I think that's been going on for decades yeah yeah and he, and he indicated too when he, the first time he called that this is something he's, he had put up with for a long time and for some reason it just really started irritating him not that long ago and I, I you know he kind of indicated that, you know, they had recently paved a new parking lot or something like that and and was kind of curious as to why the employees didn't use that uh, instead of parking out in front of his house. Um, so, you know. Is 
he requesting both sides no parking or one side no parking? He's just requesting out in front of, just directly yes. in front of his house on his side. Dick, you need to look at that anyway because that's, again, one of our more narrower streets mm -hmm. and it may be a candidate for both sides because there's also deliveries that come down through here and it's a very tight horseshoe curve they have to make. They have improved the situation somewhat, though, because you can now go back around behind the rehabilitation center and catch the road going off from Lee Hay Grove to 65. It's very congested. See, now when they're going to be opening that clinic, I think there's going to be even more traffic, and I'm assuming that you're going to get a lot down second. There might be some other ways, but right. I think you're going to get a lot more traffic. And I think that's too. why Dick thought ahead and put in this other parking yeah. lot. Yeah, I mean, it, that was another concern that he that he mentioned too with the with the new clinic opening. He's assuming that the situation is only going to get that much more oh, congested. Yeah. And I, and I did indicate that he probably has a much stronger case now than ever before with that with the clinic opening there. Um, so which also but supports again, both sides. But yeah, well, but again, you know. You know uh, reiterate that you know a no parking um, would affect him just as much as oh, yeah. uh, just as much as it would uh, the employees. So um, well, unless you did like a two-hour parking, I mean I'm not saying you should, right. but I mean there's things a, limit on that. a time frame or some kind of a limit. Well, meters, meters. parking meters. Right. That's what we right. need. Parking meters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm not sure the time. Okay change is really going to help because they have employees there 24 hours a day so it's not like they all go home at five o'clock no. and then it's free for him because it's you know employees are there all the time no so um, has anybody talked to the center there i talked to kathy um it's been quite a few months ago right after he, he first contacted me about it um, and she she indicated that uh, they had they had had conversations about it back and forth for some time, and and she had asked the employees you know at various times to respect this guy's wishes, and and she was at works for a while, and then they forget or whatever, you know there's only so much she can do. Anyway. Yeah. Um, and I understand he and he understands that too, but um, you know he he just would really like to park out in front of his house. Well, you know, if you just look at the photo that we have mm -hmm. right now, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to get a fire truck down there, wouldn't you? If you had to. Watch the ambulance try to get down through there like that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's up to you guys what you want to do. Um, do you want to set some kind of a time frame? Uh, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. was a suggestion that he had made. Of course, that's heavily slanted in his favor. Um, I guess when you think about the, emer you know, the emergency, emergency you, yeah, um, I agree with it. My take on it is we should have no parking on both sides. But I guess where I'm confused is, I mean, he said, you know, he wants to be able to park in front of his house. He does understand. I mean, no parking is no parking. Yep. And if one of our officers goes down there and right. it's lunchtime and he's parking, he's going to get a ticket. I mean, when you look at it, that is a narrow road. I've walked down that, and I, I agree. I think it should be no parking on both sides. Or in my opinion, it should be no parking on both sides. The time frame, how can you put a time frame in a place like that? Because 24-hour facility. Right. Unless you did 24 hours on one side of the street. Then you'd be in pair of the ones on the other, you know. Well, and that'd be different if there wasn't any parking available. Right. That's where I'm, I'm sitting here there's, looking at this, and there's plenty of parking. I'd like to understand why they don't use the parking lot. You know, I mean, it's just, I'm just, I'm just curious. I mean, I'm very picky about where I park, I, but I can park at an end in that parking lot. I don't have to park on the street. Well, as far as that goes, there's entrances on both ends. Mm -hmm. Some that, of that may come though from one person getting to work and the others haven't left yet. Okay. You know, you got ships leaving, you know, maybe just, they just think it's all full, so they just park out there. 
Also then they leave, five. then you got all these empty spots. Mm -hmm. Also, it's yeah. something they've been doing for years, so they take it for granted. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. So. And that could be the case, but even so, it sure looks like there's a lot of parking available. Mm -hmm. And if they don't like where they park, they could go out during their break or whatever and move, move their mm -hmm. vehicle. Mm -hmm. I guess think safety wise, at least one side should be open. I've That's right. That road many times. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, I agree. Well, at least one. Not inviting the, the affected parties to a committee meeting and just um, having their pros and cons seen. I mean, yeah. the other ones it affects them. Sure. It doesn't affect me. Sure. But I want to be fair and equitable to everybody. I understand this guy's position, but uh, yep. like Diane says, I mean, I work at a place that has shifts, and yeah, the, the, the parking lot can be congested at times. Mm -hmm. You know, and you don't know when you pull in there. You just grab a spot. You may be running late. Yep. You can't afford to drive around the for whatever reason. But mm -hmm. uh, let's get them in and ask if they want to come and have a chance to visit. And yep. I think that's out that way. That's a good start. Maybe they just make, make their own solution. Thirty have center people. Yeah, and um, okay. the affected property the owners would be okay. three of them for certain. I see. That would help us formulate the best solution. The house directly to the east of the house in question, <coughs> that's empty and vacant at this time. And has been for the one on the south end of the photo? Excuse me? The one on the south end of the photo? East side of the road. Yep, 002. Yeah. Owned, by, owned by a Hutton yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on that topic? All right. Thanks, Doug. We'll invite, uh, we'll invite the parties then to the next workshop and discussion. <coughs> next, uh, Brad, Aquatic Center Operations for 2013. Mayor, Council, how are we doing this evening? Good. Good. Well, as you know, it's that time of year to start thinking about the Aquatic Center and uh, the upcoming events of the summer. Uh, I might stand up here. Once again, you know I can talk for hours upon hours about ideas, thoughts, and, and all that stuff. Uh, I'm not going to do that this evening, but there are some thoughts that I want to bring to you guys' um, attention at this point in time. Um, first of all, um, one thing I want to look at is... Last year I brought some concerns uh, to the committee about um, having an assistant manager and the downfalls and uh, the stress that I went through throughout the portions of the summer with uh, doing everything on my own. Um, I thought I had everything lined up this summer uh, for a great candidate, um, but she decided that she's going to go study abroad um, for three-fourths of the summer, which is fine. Um, so rethinking it, rehashing it, um, I want to propose that I want to take it on again uh, by myself um, uh, without an assistant manager again. Uh, I will ask for some assistance with maybe one or two guards, uh, you know, with a, a bump in pay um, from where they're at, like we had agreed upon last year. But also this year, um, I might, and I'm going to ask for a little bit more uh, for a salary or an hourly wage for myself um, for doing everything upon my own. Uh, which we can discuss at a later date in time, but I just want to bring that to you guys' as attention that uh, it's something that I've thought through and I think I'm capable of doing it, um, but I just want you guys to be aware of when, when that time comes or when you guys are available to talk about that, I'd like to uh, have that discussion. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring to you guys' as attention um, is that the school year has been prolonged due to snow days. Um, now we're looking at uh, dismissing class on June 3rd, which is the Monday, um, <coughs> obviously it's a Monday, uh, June 3rd. Um, it's a week after our initial thought of opening. We always, the tradition is to open up more Memorial Day weekend and then run it through uh, the rest of the summer all the way to Labor Day. Um, this year, like most proposed, that we still open up on that weekend. We'd be open up Saturday, Sunday, and Monday uh, with a shorter day on Monday, which is usually noon to five. Um, since we usually had school the last two years since we've, we've opened this new facility. Um, but then we close it down um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, um, and reopen again on Saturday and Sunday. And then on Monday, the last day of school, we open up at like 4 to 8 um, and, and run it 
the way we would do them uh, throughout the course of summer. It would save a little bit on the back side, uh, dollars-wise, um, I, I think it would give it an opportunity um, also to bring it to the school um, where we will be able to offer that service to the school before the end of uh, the year if they want um, to come in and use the facility. Um, that's something that we can talk to them about and, and start figuring out um, throughout that process. Um, the hiring process, um, I've gotten that uh, started um, as far as you know, talking to some um, guards from last season. Um, I'm going to officially start interviewing uh, in the month of April, throughout the month of April. I'd like to have all my hiring done before May starts so that way I can order all the suits and get everything ready, uh, start to transition into the training process and, and things of that nature. Um, we have a great opportunity on the 15th of June uh, to be a part of this uh, triathlon that the, the county and the city's uh, putting on. Um, I'm looking forward to, to that day um, and being a part of that, uh, getting that off uh, right, I guess, um, with no other words to say about it at, at this point in time. Um, uh, last year we, we tried a few things. Um, on that night of the 15th, I would like to try to do another movie um, and have that a movie night um, and just have a, a great day-long process there, ending it with a, a dive-in movie. Um, last year, the city took the brunt of uh, the cost for the first movie. Uh, this year, I'm going to be seeking for sponsorships um, throughout the, the county or, or throughout the city, I guess, um, to help out with those costs. Um, it ranges anywhere. The lowest amount uh, for a movie is $250, ranging all the way up to $400, and then it's based on um, you know your gate versus X's and O's, um, but if we make it a free will, or if it's a free thing, commodity, um, like we've talked about um, already with this, um, you know, the, that sponsorship would cover that cost, to be honest. Um, looking to have a great, a great uh, start. Um, I've been working on things for the last couple, three weeks or so, um, trying to get the ball rolling and um, to get us to the state. So if you guys have questions, um, I'm more than happy to answer them at this point. Um, or if you guys want clarification or more thoughts, I'm more than happy. Yes, Jim. So I just wanted to uh, clarify, or I wasn't sure, like you thought you'd be open for the weekend and then not open during the school day, but you would possibly offer to us like PE classes that they wanted to come in during the day? Correct, yeah. That, my thought is we'll open on the 25th, which is, um, which is that Saturday of um, Memorial Day weekend, just like we had planned. Right. And we'd run Saturday, Sunday, and Monday as planned. And then we wouldn't be open for public until the next Saturday. But if the school wanted to come in, just like at the end of the season, we offer them to come in with their PE classes. As long as they provide their guards, the city has no cost to them. You know, the guards don't get paid for being there. Um, you know, they have to provide those, those guards. We would offer that um, throughout that week. Because honestly, you know, on the June 31st and June 3rd, or I'm sorry, May 31st and June 3rd, there's not going to be a whole lot going on. That might be an opportunity for them to get in and, and you know, do some, some safety stuff, you know, and that could be driven by, you know, we can talk about the lower elementary, not saying that's an option, but, you know, just proper etiquette, set ourselves up for a successful year, you know, going through the school, doing that. And, I mean, we have a little bit of time to, to do some planning on that, but that's just the initial thoughts. Um, I've already proposed uh, a similar idea to um, the Cal School District, uh, since that's where I'm at, if that would be something that they would be interested in, depending on what we decide here. Um, obviously, it's your guys' decision. And if you guys want to run, um, we could very well open um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. We could very well open at like 4 o'clock and close at 7 o'clock. If that's something that you think we benefit from, we can make money. Or if you think we'd be best off, you know, holding out for that week, um, that's totally up to you guys as a, as a I think it's more of a hassle to do that, just to open up for three hours. Uh, it's not so much a hassle, um, because at that point in time, um, all your sports, um, you know, it's softball and baseball. You, we have, but we also have kids that aren't involved um, that also guard that would be able to cover that time period. Um, my question is, is, what kind of turnout are we going to have um, right. with any parent, me being a parent having two kids, um, 
not in school at this point in time, but I wouldn't want my kids to go to the pool um, until 7 o'clock on a school night, especially if they have finals and stuff at the middle school and high school level uh, the, the following days. But, I mean, like I said, we're, we're capable and we're willing. Um, I'm willing to get that set up. Um, it's nothing more than a, a hoop or two to jump through. Um, a little bit more extra planning, but, I mean, it's, it's doable. If that's something that you think that, and I don't know how many people say, all right, I'm going to go pay, you know, the $2 or $3 to go swim for a couple hours. Um, you know, I don't know. What's I think you were on the right track with your first plan because the time yeah. you, you spend in lining up lifeguards to work with them two or three hours right. probably isn't going to pay off on the numbers you get to right. attend on those two or three. Right. And the other option is, too, is, is you know, other things thinking, you know, uh, we, we haven't talked to numbers as far as, you know, what the family rate's going to be and, and things of that nature. Um, you know, if we're going to raise the rate or if we're going to keep the family the same or whatever. You know, I could also be there for, for an hour or two, you know, from five to six, um, selling passes for that week. Um, I know that we usually say the cutoff is June 1st, or that's what it was throughout the month of May. You know, we might be able to extend that or whatever it is for that. And, and maybe we'd be able to sell more passes, or they could come up here where people don't get off work and can't get sick all or something. Those are all options that, you know, are out there that we can talk about at a later date time. But Doug and I are under the assumption that we're going to keep the prices the same unless we, uh, okay. we talk about it and change things. So if you're asked, right. just, you and know, I've, price just I can't walk on the, the grocery store <coughs> without being stopped saying, hey, have you heard anything about this, this, yeah. this, and, and at this time, you know, we need to put that on the right. agenda to see if you, if you guys right. are okay with that. Or you you then decide if we're going to do some kind of special like we did before. And yeah, like he's talking about. Yeah, yeah the early bird special. Yeah. Yeah, there was, right. You know, it was $100 before it was June 1st last year. This year it would be, I mean, we could do June, June 1st, which is a Saturday, um, or if you could sell it through the weekend and say no later than June 3rd. I mean, I don't know if we make a dollar or two more or sell one or two more passes. You know, it might be worth it, um, in my opinion, just to see the, the flow. But to be honest with you, most everybody had their pass, you know, before that time. Um, not too many people bought passes past the past the early bird special. Did you have any problems with the family definition in your second season? Uh, there's always discrepancies. There's always people who want to challenge the wording, um, but the long run, um, they were they understood. By the time they left, by the time I got done talking to them and saying, you know, this is what we come up with and this is how it's defined, uh, they weren't happy with it. Um, but they did, you know, understand. Uh, there was one lit older um, lady. She was saying she was going to go to City Hall. I said, that's fine. You can go talk to them at the City Hall. They're going to tell you the same thing I'm telling you right here. So, you know, there was one, that was the only issue. I mean, it was way, way more clear or it was better than, than the first year where it was, it was just a mess. But I think we're making strides in the right direction. Um, I think this year is going to be a great year again um, as far as numbers-wise. You know, I'm not sure if we're going to have more people or less people, but uh, I can guarantee the people that are there are going to be safe and, and are going to have a great time. So, um, <coughs> one step forward, you know. And if we can find 30, what was it, about $30,000? Yeah. If we can find $30,000, I find I found a climbing wall that we could add to our pool. Just, just saying, 30000 $30, <laughs> Start the hand drive. Something. <laughs> okay. Don't make sure. Donate your basketball coaching salary. Hey, you know what? I made thirty thousand dollars coaching basketball. If the kids want to climb something, they can climb all them steps to the top of the slide and right down the slide. <laughs> very very true. The fence. They don't have any couple climbing fence. That's right. Yeah, that's that's right. Right. They can go catch all the rocks that they throw. Any other questions for Brad? I'm just glad you're coming back. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited. I'm very excited. I'm sure. I, I, I tell you. Yeah. And I say that I said it last year, and I, and I said it the first year. Once you get past, you know, April, everything's downhill. I mean, once you get everything rolling, it's just the process of getting everything started, um, and hopefully, you know, we can uphold to you guys' standards and you know continue down the right track. So, if you don't have any other questions? I appreciate your time. If you can get a hold of me via email, uh, call me, whatever. Um, if you have any thoughts or ideas between now and then. Is there a, um, a time where you guys would like to see me again? Um, 
I was going to suggest that maybe for the next workshop we put on the agenda that we discuss the financial matters that you're, that you're looking at right. as far as uh, wages, wages right. and, and past Passes. prices and, right. and time frame and all that kind of stuff. So. Do we, we have a date on that? Second Monday. It's eight. Okay. I just want to make sure I didn't have a track meet. So you have a track meet. I don't have a track meet that night unless we get one rescheduled between now and then. But um, I'll pencil it in and make sure I'm here. Okay. I, can. I appreciate it. Thank you guys. Can I ask you one question? Sure can. Before the next time, could we, is it possible to know like what the other towns, if they're raising theirs before we start setting ours, even though we don't want to raise ours? You know, are, are they going through a period of raising or anything? We just, can just definitely. Kind of a, we can definitely call. Just ask them. Um, the calls one is all I want. Right. I mean, we can definitely give Iowa just Falls, and and Sheffield, and those guys a call and see what their their rates are going to be. Um, I know that we're we're at the uh, we're at the uh, lower end of all that, which is good or bad, depending on which way you want to look at. All right. Thanks, Brad. Okay, uh, thanks to continue discussion for the public water supply. Um, I know I, I spoke at the last uh, workshop about this, and uh, a few of the dentists spoke at the last workshop about it. Uh, council wanted some more time to uh, just uh, investigate and research the matter, and I guess at tonight's workshop, what I look for is uh, any, any discussion or further questions that council has uh, come up with, any any questions? The dentists are here again. So, any questions that they got for the dentists or uh, my any, any more questions on my view? Or uh, there's anybody from the public who'd like to speak on it that maybe hasn't had a chance to talk on it yet? Um, Craig and Steve, you guys went through this last time. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts? Craig was on the committee last time. I don't know if you guys have any. Anything you want to add at this time? Or? Well, I guess this might be, in my opinion, like there might be some percentage points separating what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Uh, there's been discussion, of course, where you get it, whether it's chemically injected or naturally occurring fluoride. I guess the bottom line for me is I respect both sides as far as uh, the, the professional side and the dentist and the hygienist. Uh, they claim they have nothing to gain by this and probably more to lose. I understand that. But having said that, all of this personally just comes out to me as a matter of personal choice. Uh, I think that uh, if I choose not to use fluoride in the city water, that would be my choice. But I don't have that choice. Uh, I, I don't think that we're fluoride deficient, but that's just my personal opinion. I'm not a dentist or a hygienist. But, uh, I think I'd like to be able to make that choice for myself and my family, and right now we don't have that luxury. You know, I, uh, as a personal choice, I don't care for the fluoride. I like the choice of me being able to do it myself. I have to agree with Craig on that. But having said that, I have an RO unit at home that I utilize, and that takes the fluoride out. So, and a lot of the people I've talked to, the vast majority are for the fluoride staying in. So I'm not going to, the way I'm thinking right now, if the vast majority tell me they want it, I'm going to let them have it. Whether I like it or not. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Eric Grote, I'm in Hampton 1, 114 3rd Avenue Southwest. Uh, I'm welcoming all of the dentists here today. My mother has been treated by Dr. Wagner. She brags on him all the time. She have no other. Larry Alquist, I'm a fellow lion. Paul Sensor, he's worked on my chops, and I'm happy with the job he's done. Okay? Uh, but I wanted to raise a couple of issues. Number one, an example of something that we've done, that we've done that, because we've done it that way always. You know why we don't x-ray women necessarily that are pregnant now? Because there was a gal who was a doctor in Britain who figured out 
that she wanted to research childhood cancers and why they happen. Her studies proved, because it was mainly affluent upper class folks whose children were being affected with cancers, and taken out all the other risk factors, she found out that when you x-ray pregnant woman, you get a higher incidence of childhood cancers. It took 20 years. She was worried after she had completed her study. She won a prize for it and everything else. But she was worried that she would run out of candidates to do further studies on her. She shouldn't have worried. It took 20 years to reverse that. We don't do this routinely anymore. We don't x-ray pregnant women. But somebody had the guts to stand up and say, I dare to disagree. And while I respect all of these gentlemen, and I'm hoping that they're still going to be my friends and, and do my dental work and work on my mother, um, I'd like to submit that this is a, a personal choice. I've talked with people who would rather not have the full right, but they're afraid to come up and speak because they're afraid of being ostracized by our local providers if they speak out against it. There are several other examples. I'll give you another example. Okay. Tagament, treated for peptic ulcer disease. For some 15 years, the physician in Australia who figured out that it was a microbacteria, H. pylori, that caused ulcers. Prior to that, we treated it. We said, you need to, you got too much stress in your life. You need to do this, you need to do that. They ostracized that man. He had the definitive proof. And when the proof was so overwhelming that he could no longer stand against, or the people couldn't stand against him, they had to accept that. We don't use tagament now for treating ulcers. We use Cipro antibiotic. I would submit to you that given the form that fluoride is being used for, it is a medicine. If we allow fluoride in the water, why not vitamins? Why not vitamin C? Vitamin C we know has a benefit. So should we add vitamin C to our water? In addition to that, from the Fluoride Action Network, if you can read the ants bit, and I have difficulty doing so. Recent studies, <clears throat> Europe no longer does this. China does not do this. India is having big problems taking fluoride out of the water in some cases where it's actually hurting the folks. Um, Canada, the vast majority of them, no longer does this anymore. The initial data that was done by the ADA back in the 40s and 50s, or actually the 50s was the first study that they did. In this rebuttal to anti-fluoridation, rebuttal against that, it basically talks about how the science was somewhat flawed in their study. I recently went through it with my daughter when she did scientific studies. You have to have the current studies to back up your data. Okay? And they just don't have that. Third, the source for the fluoride that we're using. Where does it come from and what is it? Um, from all the reading that I've done, and I went through several websites, in the, in the 40s and 50s, Alcoa Corporation, one of the byproducts, their toxic waste, they were dumping it into the Columbia River. They were, they were fine for this, and then shortly thereafter, we came on board with this fluoridation program to incorporate fluoride into our water systems. Illegal to dump it, but okay to put it in our water. There are 50 reasons here with the scientific data to back it up that says we shouldn't be doing this. I don't know what else I can tell you about it, but I would su suggest that you check into where the fluoride actually comes from. It is a pollutant, it is a toxin. You've got reverse osmosis at your home, Steve. How many, how many residents here can afford reverse osmosis to take the chlorine out of the water? 
I'm not allowed. I don't, it doesn't affect me in a way because I drink bottled water. I won't drink the water here because it has fluoride in it. That's part of it. I do on occasion stop the part or something like that. But I would like you to consider, if you look up the Fluoride Action Network, it, it tells the reasoning, it tells the scientific studies behind it, and it gives you the actual uh, facts and figures. Now, sometimes when folks do something and they, they say this is the way we do it because it's always been done that way, sometimes that isn't always the right answer. We've got natural fluoride in our water. Maybe it's sub-therapeutic levels. Fourth and last question before I leave that here. How do we know that one day there isn't a malfunction in the equipment? You're adding this toxic waste, which basically comes from fertilize, uh, fertilizer treatments. They pull this out as a waste product. In the old days, they had to sit there and pay huge money to sit there and put it into a, a toxic waste dump after they'd gotten busted for it a few times. But if we have a machinery malfunction and there's an overdose put into the water supply, how do you account for that? And it's totally preventable. So those are the things I have. If you have some more questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Anybody in the audience? My friends the dentists, who I hope are still my friends. Any further discussion? Thank you for your time. Thanks, sir. Southeastern in Hampton. Um, I guess one of the things that uh, Craig mentioned was he feels that he has the ability to, to, he would like to have the ability to make that choice. I understand that you know you have to make this choice on the council as a whole, but one of the things that I do as a pharmacist is get questions. Uh, I've been questioned by a uh, pregnant customer will come in and ask me, you know, is it safe for me to take this over-the-counter medication? And I inform them that, you know, they really don't test these things on humans to find out if there's any problems. And so, to err on the side of caution, if you don't need to take it, I would suggest that you not, that you suffer through whatever it is. Now, there comes up the case where you'll have a, somebody come in with a prescription, and I'll get that same question from a pregnant uh, customer, and I'll tell them, well, you have to work this out with your doctor. It's not tested on humans. You know, they've got animal, animal studies and such to go by, but it's not tested on humans. Um, and in the long run, you know, if, if you talk to your physician and he absolutely determines that, yes, you need to take this, then it's going to be a detriment to your health. She's able to make that decision on her own with her doctor, with her healthcare professional. And with the fluoride being added into the water, you know, people, they don't have that option. Um, we mentioned we have the reverse osmosis system, you know, that's something. Uh, my brother mentioned that he doesn't drink the water, but he's still exposed to fluoride through showers or baths. Um, or, you know, if he's drinking iced tea at a restaurant that's made with the water from Hampton. So, I would just, you know, if I guess I look at it as going back to the pregnant customer. If if there is a chance that it could cause a problem, I would avoid it, and that's why I would urge you to consider to discontinue the practice of adding fluoride to the Hamptons water.
my take on this, my take on this, you know, and I have been trying to do a lot of reading and educate myself on this matter, and by, you know, by far, I, I don't know as much as you guys do, and I do respect everything you tell me to do, and, but I, it comes to me, too, that I, I've thought about this. It's, it's a personal choice, and I'm not picking on fluoride. I guess maybe I'm trying to take a small stand on, there's probably a lot of things in our water, no offense, but, you know, that, that need needs to come out, okay? I understand that there's some people that, that can't afford certain things, but I also do know that it's your choice whether you get up in the morning and, and you brush your teeth or you have your children brush their teeth. Um, I like the example of vitamins. I choose to take vitamins every morning. I choose to brush my teeth three times a day. I drink the Hampton water. And, and one of the main reasons I do, and it sounds silly, but bottle, I, I'm not saying I don't want to purchase bottled water, but I feel guilty every time I open up a plastic bottle and I drink out of it and I toss it away. Okay, that makes me feel guilty. Plus, I do want to put trust in our city that I can drink their water. But I just think that we, we ought to have that choice. And if, you know, the way things are anymore with the fluoride that's, that's out there, like I said, and, you know, I use mouthwash and the toothpaste and stuff as examples, I just, I personally feel that it's time to make a change. I guess for me, uh, you know, Rick, you said talk to your physician. I guess I hear the dentist saying that we need it. Dentists are physicians. So I'm, I'm going to side with what the dentist said. Anybody have anything else to add? I'm wondering if there isn't some um, form of compromise here um, because the data that I recall from the last meeting that we had um, the water from the shallow wells by the airport was about 0 0.4. 0 0.3 is what uh, the state is saying. The and state is saying. and, the, and the, the new specs, basically, the recommended range is, um, the previous recommended range was 0.07 to 0.12. It's now 0.07, and we have another well that is at 1. Is that a 1.0? Well, well, well 3, yeah. 1.0. Yeah. So isn't there a way that we can help ourselves out naturally by uh, taking that water from that well and blending it before it goes out to the community to bring us up on an average of higher than uh, 0.3? I've got, to kind, of, I've got to kind of show you on the map here. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> what everybody is always talking about is well 3 being a blending. Well 3 is is magnificent water. It is. It's it's a darn good well. And during the summer, I use it a lot. But in the winter time, there you go again. It's unfiltered water. So I'm going to put a higher iron content and stuff into a system that in the winter time isn't using a lot of water. In the summertime, that water is going to go right through, and that iron is not going to be able to come out and stuff. So right here is my well three. Down here, my water treatment plant, you got a water tower here. When I turn on well three in the summertime, well three has a little higher of a ammonia to it because it's a really deep well. So it slows down my chlorine reaction time. So when I go out every day and do my chlorine samples, I'm finding well three water up in here and up in here. You're actually putting chlorine in. There's an entry. Yeah, point. there's that's a chlorine. Well three. Yep, at okay. well three, but it's a liquid chlorine. So what I'm finding is the well three water is going up in here. The water plant's going in here. So then you decide, okay, so we put point four in the water plant. These people here are only going to get a point four. These people up here are going to get the one point oh. These people all up here are going to get unfiltered water, which is going to be a little higher of uh, what phosphates and stuff, you're going to get a little more rotten egg smell. And plus, every community is paying for filtered water through their taxes. So these people get filtered water, these people are going to get a little higher on, on filtered water. Explain to me how we feed, maybe that's my misunderstanding, how do we feed our water talent? It comes in 
our plan here. There's only one pipe in the water tower. When I kick on the booster pumps at the water plant, and that is going to push what's ever here into that water tower and push it up. That's where our pressure comes from, the higher level of the water tower. But when you kick it on, it's the water from here is going to, everything that's in here is going to push. Mm -hmm. So there's no exact one direct feed to the tower. It, it's going to push the whole system in. So as this is pushing, all these people here are going to get unfiltered water. And all these people here are going to get filmed. So basically what you're saying, Terry, is that there is not true blended water. No, because there's not two separate pipes that just fill the water tower. It comes in from the whole system. Well, three doesn't have a direct meaning to the water tower. No, It correct. goes into the system. Yep. And right now, I mean, if it was done at night when people weren't using water, it would force more into the water tower, would it not? You I mean, would think so, but I, I found it where we run it at night. I'll go up in the morning and do my testing. I'll find a lot of well three water up in here by the hospital. But so it kind of settles off because the hospital is going to be using water all the time. So they're going to... You find that pretty consistently, though, don't you? Because in the summertime, just, yeah, I do. In the summertime, because that's when I run it the most is in the summer. Because then I know, because my flows are so high in the summertime, that that water's going to go right through and that, you know, this... The, the contaminants that you're going to get from well three, which really are contaminants, that a little higher iron, a little wet, is going to be out in that system. It's going to go right out before anybody, you know, for a quest. Well, you're the pro there. I don't understand. If there was any way that we could do, utilize what we already have uh, to minimize the amount of fluoride that we have to put in the water if we're going to continue to do that to get it up to 0. 0.7. Well, somehow you're going to either have to take well three, run it out here to the water treatment plant so I can put it through a filter, or we're going to have to put a filter up here at well three. Well, I'm sorry. I, can be filtered in I would hate to see us go to, as a compromise, uh, tweak the controlling of wells and have the dictating, uh, the controlling factor of which well that our staff is going to kick on is dependent on fluoride. I don't think we want to go down that road as to that, that dictates which well we're running is with uh, fluoride level and testing levels of fluoride. <coughs> uh, I just, there's, there's more factors involved in determining what well to run when and when to use our water plant than fluoride. I don't mean to diminish fluoride, but uh, and we'll add it if, you know, we'll continue adding it, but I don't think that we, it's, it's uh, fair to ask staff to tweak well usage to meet fluoride levels when they probably aren't going to be able to be in that range consistently. And mm -hmm. the, if, if we're supposed to be having a certain range that we're supposed to meet, and uh, that's difficult to do, by well usage, which is in those letters from public health, that's what we tried to do and it didn't work. And so um, I think I, I would recommend doing that. But. Uh, one more thing. I kind of said contaminants. Now what I have to kind of go back to is there's, there's, contam there's no contaminants in well three that are health hazard or bad. There's nuisance contaminants. That means high iron, a little higher that's going to turn your clothes may be yellow or something there, and the state doesn't require that as a health hazard. That's, I mean, we drank it for, what, 30 years before we got the water treatment plant? Well, yellow clothes are only good if you're a Hawkeye. Yeah, right. I mean, but that's the difference, because no, I'm trying to meet. There's, I, we've had well three water tested, and it's, it's very good water. It's, I mean, natural. Oh, go ahead. Everything that's not hydrogen and oxygen natural makeup of water is considered a contaminant. So the chlorine we put in, the fluoride we put in, uh, you know, so, some minerals, we have copper. The, there's there's a whole gamut. And that's all controlled by the DNR. Well, know? we don't have a choice whether we put chlorine in. Because that's right. Of, the potential danger that that provides to the community, correct? That's right. Health hazard. Yep, you could get E. coli bacteria real quick. And you do have a choice on fluoride. Correct. And one thing I just want to throw in there too, I've been here eight years, I came in, last time I, when I first started Hampton, I was right in the middle of the initial fluoride discussion I think that everybody had. Um, 
you know, when I first got here, we were using 12.3, a little bit more. And uh, what I did notice is the more well three got used, the more complaints I got. Um, and Claudia Bating and I got to be really good friends, actually, um, because when we were running well three quite a bit, Claudia would call me and laundry down the health care centers and not looking good. Uh, what we were going to do work. You know, softeners getting fouled up, what's going on. So um, there that's is the a connection to some of that. That's the opposite so. direction of what we were just talking about. It's it down in the southeast still. I mean, but that, I can't explain it. But every time that we ran that, a lot I would get complaints from from the healthcare center. Um, one, they're also on a dead end. That's another reason, you know. Um, but we flushed their mains more. We did flush their mains quite a bit more um, to alleviate that as well. Um, that's another way we, in a loop one in since then as well. Um, you know, and hopefully that I, I haven't received any complaints uh, for uh, a few years. Um, from down that way, but so uh, we did observe that um, it was the only thing we could really connect it to. Uh, inside. But, um, and like Terry said, it's not bad water, it's great water. It's just you, you know, you, like say, you can't use one one thing like fluoride or, and, and no offense to fluoride, either way, you can't, you know, shouldn't let that dictate um, what we're doing to try to hit the averages you know, to be inside the targets that we have because um, the guy's doing a good job and we are uh, hitting the mark and uh, the DNR is what I'm trying to make happen. No offense, counsel, but DNR. I like to keep my state licenses going too, so. That's why you should. <laughs> Diane, you're the only one that hasn't spoken up here. I, um, I've heard from none of the public, so I assume they really don't care. I did a lot of reading, and the CDC was one of my biggest um, places I checked on. And from the public, mainly the dental people here in town. And it doesn't appear to me that we're over adding. We're not putting too much in. We're doing the minimum levels we need to. And to me, it's one more layer of protection we can give. No, it's not going to take care of all the cavities, just like brushing your teeth doesn't, but it's one more layer we can do. And I feel it's, I don't think we're overdoing it, it's going to cause any harm, so. Do you have anything else to add? Quick question. Yeah. When you mentioned about the, the two different wells and the communication, I mean, my thought on this was that we always get wells, different wells, and that it all gets mixed together at the, at the tower. And then it's all distributed back out and then it's processed along the no, way. No, there's only one pipe. When you kick on the high service pumps, what's ever in front of that pipe gets pushed into the tower. So it can come from that well or that, which in the wintertime it's all going to come from the water treatment plant because that's about the only one I'm going to be using in the wintertime. Okay, so if we add the fluorine to it, we mm -hmm. add the fluoride to it, how do we assure that each part of the town gets the same amount of fluoride? Because fluoride doesn't dis dis dissipate, right. whatever I put in the plant is going to be reusable. Okay, but you were mentioning before that you get the differences between the wells. I'm talking about chlorine. And that wouldn't affect fluoride the same way? Uh, chlorine will di dis dissipate. It'll dissipate out. Yeah, fluoride does. So what I'm talking about is the well number three, when we run that, has a 1.0 natural right. floor. The water plant, my four wells out there only have a 0.4 natural, or a 0.3 natural. Okay. Okay. So as you're pushing in, the water coming from that section, the people in the southeast, if I quit putting fluoride in, the majority of the people in the southeast are only going to get a 0.3. Okay. It's not going to blend that perfect. Going to be a and when you do your tests, are they consistent? Do they show that basically you get a one part per million throughout the city when you test on one side versus the other, that kind of thing like that? With the system I have, uh, I don't always, not always putting a 1.0 into the system. It's going to range with the flow. Uh, so 
Well, the reason I ask, I mean, yeah. when I was a kid, my dad was a DNR. Right. He was the fourth biggest One guy day. here in the DNR. He would go around and test the water system. He yeah. took us as kids to go out and show us how it's done. Every day I test right at the water treatment plant, okay. and then every so often we'll go out in the system and take a test. And it's going to be different because if one day my, my chemical pump feeds to what my flow is. So say my flow, I'm putting out like 400 gallons a minute. Well, the chemical pump's going to be putting out at 1.0. Well, my tower gets so full, the water plant starts slowing down, maybe I'm only putting out 100 some gallons a minute. So then it's going to be a little bit higher concentration, okay. maybe up to a 1.2 or a 1.3. Then all of a sudden, when somebody opens up out to the fertilizer plant, my flows go up to 600 gallons a minute. Then I'm going to be dropping down to like a 0.7. So it's, you know. But the earlier concern I had with the possible overdosing. The state makes me put it into a day tank. I'm only allowed so much chemical per day. <coughs> I can't overheat. Okay. So every day I got to fill that tank. And there's only so much, and so if that thing does get sick down, the most I'm going to get out of there is you're probably going to be putting in maybe a 1.8 or something. So. Okay, and the and EPA's that's levels for toxic levels are at four points from 4.0. 4. 4. 4. Okay. That's your toxic level. And of course, your standards are lower than that. Oh, but yeah. We're okay. Yeah. We have a copy of our water quality report. If you ever want to see it, you look at it. Check it out. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, one, com one comment made to me um, from the public, from my wife, trying to understand cavities. Um, as she was raising her children, her eldest, her son, had perfect teeth, and he was the one who ate candy, loved Fruit Loops. Uh, went to school with hair on his teeth because he hadn't brushed his teeth for weeks at a time. And the daughter, who took immaculate care of her teeth, had cavities all the time. I don't get that. Why does that happen? I'm, t I'm talking to you guys, the pros, seriously. There's a lot of things that come to play. That, that, I mean, there's, there's quite a few different things. Can sure. yeah, go on. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, thanks, Council. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things that come to play, you know, in terms of uh, how, how fast a person gets cavities, how many cavities they get. And it has to do, um, maybe in, in small children, what kind of fluoride, or what if they had any fluoride at all? Yeah, they lived on the farm. Yeah, and and did they always live on the farm? Yep, they did. They did fluoride rinses. Okay, with the dentist that they were using. Sure, and both kids. And uh, three. They, they they probably had a little different uh, cleaning abilities, and they they're snacking. Sometimes it comes down to snacking. You know how not not what you eat, but how often, and it may not be. You know, somebody that likes candy, for instance, can eat a whole big bunch of candy, you know, and then say they rinse their mouth out after that. So they're pretty good shape as opposed to somebody who maybe eats some natural type things like raisins. You know, they might eat something that, that has just a little bit of sugar or maybe some flour, like um, cookies, you know, pastries, sometimes even things that just are starchy. You know, so, so the, the point being, it's every time that you, you do that. That's really what come, what fluoride or what cavities come down to. It's how often. You know, so so the son, you know, maybe he ate a whole big bunch of candy, but that's all that that was all of that one time. It was Whereas, pretty much nonstop. Well, you know, but that, that's hard. You know, and, but that's you know, I mean, that's a story. That's an anecdote, and that's you know, yeah. you're looking at you're looking at one person or two people. And you say, well. You know, I mean, that, that's, everybody's different, and that's the problem. But could she have just potentially had some natural resistance within her system to that? Well, that's I mean, possible, sure. I mean, genetics does... Or like, him, I mean, not her. He, he was the one that did have the perfect teeth. You know, can, can be genetically... I mean, you know, some people... They, I have people all the time tell me, I have soft teeth. And although we were taught that's not necessarily so, 
some people, for some reason, have more cavities. And, and we don't actually know, you know, when it comes right down to chlorine, it's not the only effect. Sometimes it's, uh, it's saliva. You know, you have certain enzymes in the saliva. And maybe, maybe the sun had the enzymes that, you know, we had people in, in, in dental school had never had a cavity. And they were trying to test. They were saying, why do these people not have any cavities? You know, as, the, as opposed to the rest of us, myself included, you know, who, who had cavities as kids. And my dad was a dentist. So, so, I mean, you know, it's just individual variation, I guess, is what you have to say. That helps. I don't know. <laughs> I know where the answer is, but. but you're sure digging the high base. <laughs> well, <laughs> where are they going? That's right. Is there anything else to add at this time? Questions, comments? Oh, I don't have anything else. Is there any unfinished business we need to attend to? Okay. Thank you. We'll adjourn at 736 then. <laughs>